Hi, everyone. This is James Ead at the Ead Foundation. The Ead Foundation is dedicated to building communities through chess. We support chess literature, literacy and chess excellence. And if you build a community through chess, if you're, you can access the internet, you can find the chess community. If you can't access the internet, you can build a community by yourselves. And uh, the Ead Foundation can help you build that community. Because if you're part of a community, you'll never find yourself alone. So that's the foundation of the Eid Foundation. And I have a special guest today on the Chess Files. The answers are out there. The question today is, what can we make of a tournament result such as Tata Steel, where the best players of the world were competing to um, win one of the most prestigious tournaments in, in the world? And uh, do we have the right to make assessments based on the results of this. And I, I can't do it myself, so I asked a special guest. You may know him. Uh, this is Alex, Grandmaster Alex. Oh, that's just his picture, I'm sorry. Let me bring uh, the real Alex. Uh, there he is, Alex Yermolinsky, the <laughs> Grandmaster, the Yerminator. Thanks to Jerry Hankin, that's the way we've coined the way we talk to, to about you behind your back. Um, so, but you are a grandmaster. You're a former U.S. champion twice, I believe, and um, uh, so you you came uh, into the United States and won just about everything you looked at. And uh, I think you're more than credible to talk about what should we take away from a tournament like Tata's on you. Can we take away like uh, okay, Magnus uh, didn't win it, so he's done. Somebody's better than him now, or is that leaping to conclusions? First of all, Jim, thank you for having me. I'm. Uh, it's not my first time here. I have very warm memories of my uh, first two visits here, I believe, and uh, I'm glad to be back. And uh, well, so, uh, wanna say hello to all uh, to all your audience um, about the Tata Steel tournament. I'm looking at the cross table of this event. Few things strike me as if I didn't know them before. Suppose if I look for the first time. Magnus Carlsen, world champion in sixth place. All right, that's number one. Uh, number two, young Krzysztof Duda, one of the most promising, talented young players in the world. Two losses and no wins to his credit. I tell you what, if we were to run this tournament again, I'm, well, probably both uh, results would be reversed. I mean, I simply don't see uh, young Krzysztof Duda not winning one game. Okay. Third thing that strikes me, um, okay, it's not surprising, it's over-presentation of players from the European Union. Mm. Is it truly an international tournament now? Big question to me. I understand that uh, uh, some people, they were invited and they couldn't make it because of the pandemic, uh, restrictions, coronavirus and all that. Uh, the last two victims of that were, I believe, uh, Daniel Dubov, whose arrival was highly anticipated. He had to, he had to cancel his plans because some, one of his family members contracted COVID and uh, no, because of the exposure. We don't, uh, we don't know if Daniel himself uh, tested positive on that. That's enough when your family member yes. and that already puts you in, in this. And, uh, there were also some others. Uh, as far as people who uh, turned down their invitation, one name immediately comes to mind. Jan Nepomnishi. Why did Nepo turn it down? He did it a while ago. He wasn't at uh, the last moment. So apparently there was no, no word about the COVID situation over there. Um, American players, 
No right, Caruana made it there, but we of course know that Caruana has dual citizenship and he has European passport. Yes. Now, no, Hikaru, obviously he's busy on his main job being a streamer and whatnot, but what about Wesley so? Why isn't Wesley there? So there are some questions. Uh, the Chinese players, again. Oh, yeah, yeah. How about those guys? So, well, I, I don't want to blame the organizers. Well, I, blaming anybody is just silly in this situation, right? right? We all know that the, the state the world in uh, now, and uh, I guess they did best under the circumstances. Uh, so it's an interesting point that you're making. The, it was European Union uh, kind of um, focus, but the tournament itself is held in the city. Uh, my pronunciation is going <clears> to <throat> be terrible, but Vilkensy. And uh, it has a long history of running strong Grandmaster tournaments. So we want to just you know stop and say thank you, organizers, for holding those tournaments, and thank you for that city for hosting uh, chess players and uh, putting on a great tournament year after year for so many years. Um, but there's also the question of how do we proceed the tournament, and if it's primarily European Union, uh, then that that should we should just notice that. No, that is what it is, yeah. It's interesting about the I was, I was right there at that uh, turning point, 1999, when this tournament became uh, the elite tournament. Yes. Super strong tournament with uh, top players. Um, it wasn't like this uh, two years prior to that when I played. In 97, it was still, a, it was a strong tournament, obviously. I remember that uh, Victor Korshno and Nigel Short, they finished to somewhere in the bottom of the of the table, so the tournament was quite good. I actually did well in that tournament. I finished fifth. I had Ma Magnus Carlsen-like result mm -hmm. about this. Uh, and then I was invited to play again in 98, but somehow, it, because of the mix-up, I wasn't able to attend, and they... To my great regret, but they extended this invitation to the following year in '99, and I couldn't recognize the tournament. Round one, I played Swedwa. Round two, I played Kramnik. Round three, I played Kasparov. Why is that? You know, I want to play these people. Right. Uh, I mean, okay. Well, thankfully, it was the last time you know I played there. So it's too much, really, too much. There were a series of tournaments around those times, like Lenares. Well, yeah, why didn't they all stay in Linares where they belong, you know, and left the YKNZ tournament for us, you know, like people, whatever, maybe placed. Uh, okay, I'm trying to recall in 1997, Valery Salov won. Jeroen Piquet had a fantastic tournament. He should have won it. I beat him in the last round. Well, there were decent players there, obviously. Right. But it's like it wasn't overwhelming. I was at that time somewhere around number 20 in the world, maybe 25, and I felt that I belonged in there. And two years later, you know, I was, as Kasparov put it, a chess tourist. And I didn't want to be a chess tourist. If I wanted to be a chess tourist, I would go to Hawaii or somewhere else. Yes. You know, who wants to be a chess tourist in, in Waikanzi in January? <laughs> I mean, this whole thing was completely wrong. And besides, you probably heard of this. Even now, it's a long-standing tradition of the the absolute majority of funds go into into uh, um, appearance fees. There is a little, very little, in terms of prize fund in in that tournament. It's another tradition that they keep. Interesting. Yes, That's how it is. So, they, from a point of view of a player who cannot possibly finish. Uh, higher than, I don't know, fifth place. It is just, I don't know, a great learning experience. Yeah, right. What did I learn? That I suck at chess? Like, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does, it does seem, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but it does seem that there's an elite amount of players and a, a relatively few that can make a living in chess and make a lot of money in chess. And the rest of it, is it drastic fall off? Is that true? Well, absolutely it is true, yeah. Uh, no, maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. I don't know if the world really needs that uh, 
that many successful chess players. And some people talk about this great pyramid, like you have to preserve all the from the foundation up in order to have the the top there. I'm not quite sure. I think that's a kind of a dated way of thinking. I personally think if if there was just uh, no one there, just like uh, amateur players, whatever, who play online, and uh, and then I don't know, a couple of dozen players at the top, I think there would be enough. I don't think you know that would make any difference. Interesting. I, from, I, from my point of view, you know, people. I mean, chess became entertainment, right? I mean, you basically it's it's no longer sport in the sense that no sport assumes some kind of qualification um, procedure, right? Some kind of like we all equal starting position and let the best man win. It's not the case in chess. Well, I'm not saying that people who who win are not best. You know, maybe they are, but uh, there is no there is no way for. Uh, for a random guy, you know, to, I don't know, just to come up and beat them all, you know, the system is stacked up against them, which is okay, I suppose, you know, so, well, that's what I'm thinking. That's why you, you ask what I learned from this tournament. Uh, I mean, I didn't really come to learn anything from this tournament. I, I enjoyed it as a spectator, just watching games and uh, that's, so that's the, that's the whole thing. And interesting that you say that because um, as a spectator, what goes into making a spectator um, experience valuable or more enjoyable or not? I'm having a problem getting the audio. I don't really know why, you know, it's it's coming to me that maybe it's at my end, but no, I'm I will sorry. ask you to repeat okay. this. I, I will repeat the question. And I don't know if it's worse if I'm coming closer or further away. But um, I'll speak more slowly. Yes. Um, my question is, what makes a good spectator or a bad spectator? Well, uh, what I'm going to say might surprise a lot of listeners. Well, I think the players, the participants, are relatively less important than this. Well, I think what, the, what makes that show is uh, the, the commentators. I think, you know, that this is, I mean, all right, you know, from my old days watching sports on television, well, uh, all right, what are you doing tonight? Well, tonight, tonight's Monday night, I'm watching Monday night football. Who's playing? I don't know. It's Monday night football. No, well, I, I suppose that there would be some teams, and uh, I mean, that I know I'm familiar with, but, but they're coming to watch the Monday night football because of the great trio, right? Of yeah. Of uh, of announcers, that was the whole thing. And uh, why would I why would I sit there and watch the ESPN, right, all the time around the clock, Sports Center? Well, didn't I already knew the scores? I could get the scores anywhere. No, it was because of Chris Berman. The That's the simple simple answer, you know. Like, and I'm sure people did it in in other uh, areas of. Uh, entertainment, be it whatever. I mean, I would include politics in that as well. And, and all other stuff. Uh, I mean, they just simply want to see the host because they like the host. Do we really have those? Well, they're working on it, but working on it not, not necessarily productive. Some people get weeded out because there is a lot of uh, nepotism over there and personal connections. I see. Well, that's how it is. And somehow it's still thought to be the, the the less important thing. If I were an organizer of a chess tournament, I would work on uh, securing the commentator's crew even harder than I would work on securing the participation of some players. Because without that, it, I don't think I would succeed. That's interesting. And I'm, I've asked my producer to check into my audio. But um, we'll, we'll see if he can do anything. Well, possibly it's at my end. You know, I'm in I'm in the middle of uh, uh, upgrading my computer system, and things are not really working very well on this machine. So it could be it's just at my end. Um, no, I can hear it. 
So I'm trying to do everything I can and ask my producer to help me. But um, so far, we'll just keep going with the idea of right. computers. Because in St. Louis, I, I've spoken with, with Rex Senkfog about he is in love with his commentators. He thinks they're the greatest. And I, I couldn't be happier with them. Also, Yasser, um, Maurice Ashley, Jen Shahad, and um, uh, I'm forgetting a couple others that are that are very, they have a lot of personality. They bring all, not only excellent analysis, but they bring good personality to it. Is that what you're talking about, having personality? Exactly. That's number one. Well, actually, recently I made a list of five requirements uh, for, to fit the job description. Mm -hmm. Number one is the personality. Well, that no, it, it has to be a, a recognizable person. We can use all these things, including that great picture of mine, which I thought would never see a light of day, but it did. And uh, all other stuff, whatever. You catch phrases, whatever it is, you know. Then my, uh, I, I, I tried with this, you know, how about good time of day? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all, all the stuff, you know, there's a little stuff, but it makes some difference, right? So I absolutely agree with you. It has to be personality. Otherwise, I mean, the best... Uh, Sportscasters, they're always great personalities. And it's not not only in the, in, the, in the United States. It's also back from the days in the Soviet Union. Well, there were people, you know, like, oh, the, he's there. Well, I'm going to watch this watch this game for sure because this guy is in the booth. Yeah. You can't miss this guy. If it's someone yeah. else, ah, maybe, maybe not. And there was something... Uh, where if, if they were covering it, it meant it was a big event, like Bob Costas. Uh, well, that that too, but no, well, that's that's how it is. So they're good. That's why they get the biggest events. But you don't know again, you know, why more people tune in. Is that because of the importance of the event, or it's because of it's Bob Costas? Mm -hmm. We don't know. It's probably both in some ways. Mm -hmm. Now going further down the list. Now what else do we need? Well, need to be able to analyze chess positions. I understand. I'm getting into this big debate, you know, should uh, computer suggestions be used or, or not? Okay, well, I personally always refuse to do this. Uh, I thought it would take something away. Although, you know, I understand the other point of view that say, you know, they look at some stuff that is wrong because they blundering on the very second move or whatnot of their line and it's uh, all right. Okay, whatever. We can elaborate on this, but I'm not sure it's really that important. What What is important that absolutely unacceptable when the computer moves are mentioned without crediting the computer in every phrase that commentator must say, okay, computer says this. Okay, so that, if if this is omitted somehow, then it's wrong. And it, I don't know, borderline cheating, in my opinion. Okay. Now, all right, so uh, still be, be able to play, and more importantly, uh, well, when you play chess, well, it teaches you humility. When you're long away from chess tournaments, then you be, uh, begin to think that chess is easy. And it's not, you know. You need those reminders how difficult it is to find moves at the chessboard. Yeah. So I know that uh, not all commentators can be active as much as they used to, but at least know a little bit of chess activity. I think it's a, it's a requirement in this case. Otherwise... You just go away from the game. Now, that brings to question the the St. Louis crew. How many games they played between the three of them in the past five years? And I, I can't say. I have um, an idea that they're, they're not as active as they once were, that's for sure. No, right. Well, it's my opinion. Again, you know, I have nothing against it the way they do. And, and Rex, obviously, is the... As the boss paymaster over there, he has the right to select the people you know, they want. Well, another thing is, well, you can't really talk about chess all the time. And, uh, well, uh, obviously we follow the chess moves, but they're always, they need to talk about some other things, even just to give the listener and the viewer, viewer whatever you call it, a little bit of a break. 
So they need to be some kind of references, cultural, whatever, literature, music, sports, movies, and all that, you know, that absolutely is absolute must. In I agree. If the person is not familiar with the, with the culture of the target audience, you know, then it cannot be the commentator or that. I think that um, you're making some interesting points um, because I, you know, I know that I, I am a spectator at a lot of different types of things, mostly sporting events, you know, and um, I know my, my father-in-law used to turn the volume down because he, the, he found that the commentators just annoyed him because uh, especially with baseball, because he was a real baseball guy. And so the baseball announcers annoyed him and he would turn the volume down. But when you can listen to someone who is enthusiastic about what they're seeing, knowledgeable about what they're seeing, and can also inject humor into what they're seeing. Humor is essential, of course. That's why all that stuff. And of course, you know, you have to have your signature things, but we already talked about this. The home run call, right? Yeah. Can you imagine a baseball announcer without their signature home run call? Adios, amigos. Yeah, all, all that, you know. And that baby's gone. <laughs> yeah, anyway, this is an important stuff. But I'm not I'm not done, actually, going down this list. Well, in chess, chess has rich history, obviously. We know that. It's very important to be well-versed in that. And, um, well, those... Uh, I mean, it's part of what I call chess culture. And uh, you you don't really, I mean, a lot they say, oh, this guy has great chess culture because they read a lot of books. No, well, yeah, it's true. But it's also kind of living through this yourself. I mean, you a chess player learns through no, well, the joy of victory and the, the bitterness of defeat, learns something. That something is, well, it's not like chess is there for you. Uh, it's not like you're there for chess. Chess is there for you, and it's a great gift to you. And uh, I think that part is, it takes time uh, to really realize that. And I think that gives that necessary humility. And a person like this would not, uh, would not criticize players. And sometimes you know that the comments, particularly computer based, they come across as too too cold and you no, know, too critical. And it's almost like you say, "What are you talking about? Are you a chess player?" I mean, and you know that the guy is a chess player, but the, maybe they forgot about this. Or I think it's simply because that they didn't go through that thing as I described. So allow me to say this: Well, you may be a genius in your field, but. Can you really be a professor at 25? It's a big right. question to me. Now, it's ageism reversed. I've been told many times, in simple words, well, you know, Alex, well, we want to get younger people to work on our shows. Okay, I understand. Well, I, I, I mean, I don't look good, whatever. Maybe I get tired in my eyes or whatever. They start losing the spark and all that, you know. But, yes. but I will reverse the situation. Do I really want to see a 25-year-old guy over there as a commentator? My answer is no. Learn Well, I don't know. They need to learn a lot of things. They need to earn their stripes. Now, and I'm coming down, I think, to the end of it. And, uh, and one, but last but not the least, physical gifts. Are you physically gifted to be a commentator? What about your voice? Huh? Peter Lecker, hello? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, yeah, I know, I know. Well, th that's how it is. Okay, I don't have all the physical gifts. I never tried to play basketball. And even if I started at 10 years old, you know, I don't think I would be able to dunk it. You know, white men can jump. They can't dunk. You know, they all that stuff. Okay, you all know that. Now... But, you know, well, I don't know what gave me, you know, this kind of vocal cords, you know, that everybody's enjoying now. Yeah. And you know it very well that I can talk nonstop for six hours. Yeah. All right. No, well, it's, you have to be able to do this. Sorry. Find me one guy, a radio personality with the, how to put it, with weak voice. No, it's not. They don't it's exist. They, they, they simply they would not get the job. So what's up with this uh, with chess commentators in that yeah. department? 
that's um, that's also very good. Is that the end of your list? Because I, I yes, heard that's that, the yeah. end of the list. You know, I don't think I have anything to add to this uh, commentating business. I think we talked uh, enough about it. Perhaps we okay. should go to chess and talk about Magnus Carlsen. Uh, no, or, I, or, or Jordan Van Forest. I don't know who they are talking about. Well, you know, because I, I, I can't um, I play the age card either because I am an old dog that has difficulty <laughs> learning new tricks. And I, uh, But I do think experience counts. And I think if you have that experience, if you have learned about the chess culture, so many of the young players today, uh, you know, don't know who Capablanca is or does, doesn't have a, a perception of the past. And without that, you cannot think of, well, what does Tata Steel mean in the, the long run? I mean, oh, yeah, it, because, because you, there have always been great tournaments and there have been s historical tournaments like uh, New York 1924, where you see a, see a changing of the guard possibly, where you know people are coming and, and showing their strength and um, all of a sudden then they become world champion. Uh, there are other examples. Awesome. You know, and uh, like uh, Hastings in the late uh, 1990s. 1895, yeah. 1895. And uh, all, all of a sudden, there's a, you know, change. There's something that is of historical significance. And uh, so let, let me ask you, well, sorry, I'm interrupting. Let me ask you no. this. Do you think that the, this pandemic could have a positive effect in the sense that we'll have tournaments like this maybe once or twice a year? And then, you know, they would be uh, more like, more chance that there would be watershed tournaments and they will be remembered just because of that. Well, I think it's a, it's a good chance that we will remember this tournament because of one forest and, uh, and all that, but not only because of that, it's just because it's one tournament and when, when's the next one? We don't know. Exactly. Yes. Uh, good. Um, because Let's do it this way. We, we grew up, we grew up in over the board competitions and it was hard for me to adjust to the online world, but the people growing up today, the online world is there for them and they have known it and they don't have any trouble adjusting to it. So they can play anyone, anywhere at any time. That is true. No, well, again, you know, I don't want to take anything away, but there, there, uh, from, uh, from the young generation, well, I, I mean, I have two kids, you know, living with me in the, in the home. So, I mean, I get reminded of the difference, differences between me and them, you know, daily and not once. So, well, it's normal, but... Of course. When they say, all right, so suppose chess.com, or they decided to go with younger audience, and that's why they have the, the this change. Okay, fine, they can do this. Fantastic. Uh, but the guys like us, I mean, we're still alive. And moreover, in, by and large, we have more money, uh, well, discretionary income at least, than the average viewer of chess.com. Why shouldn't we have our platform uh, what the sort of targets us? And for us, it's important to, to talk about why Leonid Stein did not play in the candidates, although he did well into in interzonals and stuff like this. That holds very little interest for, for a 13-year-old or 20-year-old. But we're still alive, Jim. We are still alive. I can see that you're alive. Yep. Yeah. Well, so... We need to we need to have this platform, and unfortunately, I don't see it now. I mean, there is Chess Twenty Four, but Chess Twenty Four, all due respect, it has this strong European flavor. It's based in Europe, and and all these guys there are Europeans. I think the U United States of America, with the chess as popular as as it is, well, could could really use a, an online chess source. Uh, similar to that, uh, for promotion of the game, even if it sounds strange, why do we promote the game among the 60-year-olds? No, because that's where the money is. That's one answer. Well, what you're talking about is marketing, which chess... Well, is exactly. Who you, who you, your target audience, you know? Like, I mean, I understand, you know, like it's ages 13 through 34, whatever, you know, but we're not there, but there are other ages, and they age groups and, uh, and I think they would they would really benefit from this I don't know the internet chess club unfortunately they don't have the funds and they don't have the 
I mean, aggressive leadership over there. They probably could have been leading this. And, but unfortunately, yeah. it's not happening over there. Well, I, I appreciate what they do, you know, and I still keep my collaboration with the Internet Chess Club. But no, they, they didn't make that, uh, that step forward I was talking about. Yeah, and the other thing that experience can, can do for you is it can get, give you the ability to lead. So maybe what you're talking about is something that we haven't seen yet, but is around the corner. Let's hope. Yeah, hope, well, hopefully. No, right, about the tournament itself. Now, uh, quickly I go over the stuff. You know, I'm, I'm happy for Van Forest. It's the first time a Dutch player won this tournament in a very long time, and certainly first time since the tournament uh, gained this elite status. Uh, Great play, well, opening preparation. I I would say probably got lucky, but no, luck is always part of that. If you if you go into win the tournament, well, there were some things. It's not like every move that he played was prepared at home. There were quite a few decisions that Jordan had to had to take, and uh, I think his uh, his tournament strategy was to play more complex moves and take more risks. And uh, that paid off greatly. Now, of the uh, Giri, no, well, it's it's almost a given that Giri would have a good tournament in YKNZ. He gains rating points at YKNZ, and then before the pandemic, he would slowly lose them, you know, over the rest of the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's nothing new over there. Well, the emergence of Andrei Yesipenko, well, I am obviously a little more familiar because I speak Russian and I follow uh, Russian internet chess sources. The, mm -hmm. No, there was a long time there, was, there has been talk about Yesipenko as, uh, as a talent. Well, so I'm glad he made this uh, big statement. He's 18 years old, so whatever. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I should mention all oh, Caruana, Firuja. They didn't surprise me. I expected them to be there. And Carlson, I I think that the no well, the rumors of Carlson's decline uh, greatly exaggerated. Yeah. The, well, anyway, you can have a bad tournament, and besides, how bad it was. He won three games and lost only one. Lost fifteen rating points. He has rating points to lose. He still uh, he still. 20 or 30 points ahead of Caruana. And it's not like Caruana is making gigantic strides. Yeah. And then we come to this kind of a gray area. Well, uh, I expected more from some players. I mentioned Duda and Anton Gujaro as well. I think, you know, Anton is a very talented player. Um, something just didn't work for him. Um, you can have an off night. Yeah. Well, Vashiava Graf, obviously, it's a big thing. I didn't mention Maxim. Well, there is this point of view. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but the interruption of the candidates affected Vashiava Graf more than any, anybody else. He found himself in a shared lead after his great victory over Nipomnishi in the very last round before the, before the interruption. And the, no, he really wanted the tournament to continue. He had the momentum. He had the, the whole yeah. thing. And then look what happened. Yes. So maybe it affected him in psychologically. In, as I noticed, you know, he, he didn't show much heart and desire to play the Sunline tournaments. And uh, played surprisingly weak, particularly in the beginning of this in the summer. That toward the end of last year, he had some better results because he kind of got more used to it. But... But now we see another thing like this, and that's a, it's a big blow. But if candidates resume as scheduled, maybe it could be a, could be a good thing for MVL. So he got all the losing out of his system, and now he can get back to work and win the candidates. Yes, and and the NBA had a bubble where they could mm -hmm. bring everybody and keep them safe. So can't just do that. No, I don't really know. I mean, what, for one tournament? No, how long can people stay there in that bubble? And it's a season for the... I think that the money has to be of a different uh, different level. 
always comes I mean, down. if you increase it by a factor of 10, you know, maybe you can convince uh, Nakamura to spend uh, half a year in the bubble. But it better be, you know, 10 times the yes, money. Yeah. Right. Well, I don't think that these guys would agree to do this for a couple hundred thousand dollars. I don't think so. It's not yeah. worth it for them. Billions. Can pull it off, maybe. Yeah. Well, Alex, oh. do you have any concluding remarks before we end the show today? I thank you so much for being my guest. Uh, you're um, always entertaining and interesting to listen to. Well, the the concluding remark it's on a personal level, and uh, I'm not even sure that I I should be mentioning this, but uh, there is another side of uh, this new internet world and. Uh, uh, which is kind of a dark side. Well, I'll put it this way. Not every internet chess source, particularly when it comes to organizing group lessons when you attend lectures by grandmasters, uh, is run by honest people. I had very negative experience with one outfit like this. I worked for them for a long time, but about since the summer, they stopped paying me, uh, citing various reasons, and ultimately never paid. The outfit is based out of India, and it's called Nurture. You know, N-U-R-T-R. Hired many grandmasters. I was not the only one who got cheated. I will start with Nigel Short. I will mention Jacob Agard, who's even more famous as a chess publisher and a teacher and yes, author of books of and all that. You know, he had complaints Wonderful, about these right? guys. So if you're listening to me now, my advice, stay away from these people. You know, like, obviously, it's... I'm not going to take any steps, you know, legal or whatnot. I just hope they wither and die because people would simply start stop participating in both capacity of a lecturer and a student. If you're a student and they take your money, they will keep it for themselves. Nurture. Well, thank you again, Alex. And I um, apologize for my audio, but uh, I will take you backstage now, but we will stay in touch. All right. All right, I um, will have words with my producer over my audio difficulties today. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, this has been The Chess Files. The answers are out there. And that was the great Grandmaster Alex Yermolinsky, who was known as the Yerminator because he just plowed through the opposition as though they weren't there. And um, now he, as I have, has aged a little bit and we're adopting new rules. And mine is to be running the Eid Foundation. And the Eid Foundation is dedicated to chess literacy, to so people who can read and write chess. Uh, it opens up the world, the ocean of literature to them. And they can re re reproduce their own games and study their own games. And this leads to the ability, not the requirement, but the ability to achieve chess excellence. So the Eid Foundation also supports chess excellence. And the reason we do this, both the literacy and the excellence, is to form communities. And with the internet, we can connect to anyone, anywhere, at any time. And we can have a community. So we we'll never feel alone. And if you can't get to the internet, you can build the community wherever you are, whatever language you speak, whatever country you're from. And this is the purpose of the foundation. And if you can't uh, access the materials to start, we can help you with that. That's the purpose of the Eid Foundation. And now I would like to um, just tell you that we, we try to broadcast every Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern. And if you didn't like this show because of my audio or for whatever reason, you can always attend and there will be something new. There will be always questions out there and the answers will be too.